Hey everybody, what is happening? Glad to see glad to see so many of you joining in. Thanks a lot, guys, on this uh, Halloween. That, uh, as a lot of you know, we had the uh, you know we had the tail end of that hurricane come through. Fortunately, we fared pretty well, but we had a, a lot of friends and local communities and stuff without power for quite a while. So uh, uh, anyway, so uh, today I, I thought this would be something kind of kind of new and different to give people some time to think about questions. So what I've done is I've, I've gathered together uh, questions from, from you guys, and I think I've got about 10 of those, and I want to cover those questions and, uh, and give some answers. And then once we, once we get those questions answered, of course, I've got the chat up here, and we're going to you know, start answering all of your questions, too, while we're here. And I figure we can run for about an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, if that works, depending on what everybody has going on. So uh, a couple of updates I want to give you. Uh, if you remember, you know, we're doing the Skunk Works t-shirts. And what I do with that, since uh, all the Ironman races and things were virtually canceled, and quite honestly, I was exhausted from doing six Ironman races in two and a half years for my charity, uh, the, one of the ways I was trying to raise some money was to sell these shirts, 25 bucks a piece, uh, we pay $15 a piece for the shirt, so that was a $10 profit. So I've been feeding that $10 from each t-shirt sale uh, back into the charity. And as it stands right now, uh, I'll be writing a check for almost $1,600 to the charity. So thanks a lot, guys, for buying the t-shirts. It's enabled us to uh, feed back into, uh, back into the charity to help out some kids and some veterans. So that's a really special thing for us. So thanks for doing your part to help. Uh, also, there's, I'm gonna make several references during our time here today, uh, and I'll reference several things in the, uh, in the description, uh, links in the description about some prior videos that we've done. Also, how you can get one of these t-shirts if you're in, interested. I've got a few left. Uh, once we run out of these, I'm actually gonna do a different design, uh, do something a little more nostalgic maybe, have a cool look to it, but it'll still, of course, have the skunk on it. So I think people are becoming more and more a fan of the skunk. So um, is, is the audio coming through good? If you guys don't mind giving me a comment here real quick, just to let me know that uh, we're sounding good. No, I, I uh, do not have the best radio voice in the world, but we give it a shot uh, anyway. So, um, all right, now, as far as the, uh, the questions, now, I got a lot of, uh, I see many, many common questions uh, over and over again, and a, and a lot of those common questions uh, are really answered in great detail in videos we've done in the past, and, and I know a lot of you guys have, you know, been following for, for quite a while, and, uh, but, you know, I've been putting videos up for years. And so uh, what, I, what I would like to do on some of these questions you guys sent, I'm going to give you a name mention for asking the question. And I'll probably refer, just for the sake of time, uh, refer you to previous videos that are on the channel. And I've put links to several of those videos in the description. So I'll refer you there just because they go in so much detail. And, and we're going to try to cover as much as we can today. So, uh, But then I've also got what I'm going to call my highlighted comments. Some that, that seem to be unique um, that I honestly I think are just really good questions. So for those of you, if I call your name and we discuss your question, there's going to be 10 of you, uh, I'm going to ask you that you email Pete at ProTwin.com, P-E-T-E, -E, he's my parts manager, Pete at ProTwin.com, mention the video, and give him your name, address, and shirt size, and we're going to send you out a, uh, a t-shirt uh, for asking a fantastic question. So, um, guys, uh, oh, and one last thing, feel free to ask the questions uh, in the comments there. Uh, and you can go ahead and ask your questions because we'll, we'll look at the time that we have left. I'll review all the questions that I have here. And, of course, if we have time left, then we're going to go through the, uh, the comments on the live chat and, and address any of the questions that you have. And actually, it would help me a little bit, too, because uh, uh, stuff's coming up like crazy. If you could do something to help your question stand out, like maybe put a couple of asterisks or something like that in front of it, uh, just so that I know it's a, a question and, and I, can, um, I can jump on that and get that answered. So uh, let's dive in and get started, guys. Uh, oh, yeah, this. This is a new addition, huh? Um, it's signs of aging. Uh, I've, I've discovered, you know, I started having, having headaches more and more uh, 
more often and, you know, reading micrometers and dial indicators and things like that. Uh, so fortunately, they're just readers. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, I've only, well, I've only got one eye left. I, I know uh, it's come up before what's wrong with my right eye there. I was actually shot with a, uh, a 22 C, uh, CO2 pistol when I was a kid. And uh, so I'm blind in my right eye which means my left one, I've traditionally always had 2010 or even better in my left one. And it worked, the eye worked really well, but now I'm getting older. It's time for some cheap readers. So, all right, let's get started. Um, one of the first highlighted questions comes from Dan Sison. Dan Sison asks, question on the valve springs, which is better to run on a performance engine, single or double springs and why? So understand a lot of this, when you get to an upper level of engine building and engine designing, uh, there's a lot of, of decisions that the designer and builder have to make that are based on experience, uh, what they've seen and things like that. And sometimes there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. Um, I know there's, you know, there are a handful of really good engine builders out there and we do things different. I wouldn't say that any of these guys do things wrong. They have their reasons for doing it the way that they do. Uh, the big question is, is when you ask someone a question like that and you're trying to qualify that builder to determine if you want to do business with them, uh, they should be able to give you a why and not just regurgitate what they've heard in you know, or seen in other places. So there should always be a reason. So let me answer your question, Dan. Um, first off, there, there, there's no debate that a dual coil spring will have a little bit more or create a little more parasitic loss than what a single spring will. Uh, you know, you can even run the same seat pressures and and still have a, a little bit more parasitic loss with a dual spring all right the main reason why i choose to run dual springs on all my builds is in case the valve spring breaks now i i'm not going to say that you know a, a a typical single coil or beehive spring is um you know is more likely to break i, I i'm not saying that at all but i'm saying i like that little bit of added insurance of having a second spring that'll keep that valve up in the head in case the thing broke. So it's um, it's more for me about insurance and, and I'm willing to give up maybe, you know, just a little bit of power number on a dyno uh, in order to have that added security. Uh, one other thing, and, and this is a debated topic as well, uh, when, you know, springs are going up and down, they don't just compress and back and press and back. If you were to see one in slow motion, the, the spring will actually oscillate like this, all right? And, and part of determining valve seat pressures is not only the weight of the valve, the RPM of the engine, things like that, but is trying to keep that spring down on its seat and tight against the retainer at the same time while it's doing this oscillation. So, you know, you've got different valve seat pressures and things like that. Again, experience um, is typically what determines a lot of that. But the two springs react differently. If the, you know, a beehive spring can be slightly less, uh, have slightly less opportunity or to oscillate a bit, but at the same time, sometimes to prevent that, you have to run a higher seat pressure. But again, a, a, this is a, a debated topic. Um, as, as to far as which one is better for me, I like to run the duels in case the spring breaks. So great question, Dan. Um, let's see next. Marcel asks, how do I identify normal and abnormal wear? Replace or don't replace? That's also a good question. So I'm, I'm going to assume, I believe what he's talking about is individual, you know, individual components. Uh, you, you know, internal engine components, pistons and, and cam plates and all this type of stuff. Uh, to a very large degree, uh, there's, it's all about clearances. So you can actually, you know, physically measure uh, how far the valve stem protrusion is coming out of the head, the concentricity of the seat to the guide. You can measure a valve stem, measure the guide. And, and there are uh, standards for that. A lot of those, you know, for, for stock components, those standards are actually in the service manuals. They will give you the, the tolerances and, and the limits there. Again, they're very broad. 
So when you start getting into precision machine work and as the as the engine makes more power, then it's more important that uh, that you really focus in on what's allowable. But it, you can even, and, and much of it is visual inspection and also just by experience. Uh, you know, there, there are rules of thumb, like, you know, if you see a scratch on a cylinder, you know, it's, some people will say that, you know, if you rub it with a penny and some of the copper transfers, then it's too big of a scratch. Or if you can feel it with your fingernail, and, you know, a lot of that is, is subjective, of course. But uh, it's uh, normal and abnormal wear, as far as comparing the two. There are certain wear patterns that, that occur, say, inside a cam plate. Uh, and, and the shape of, of where the gear rotor rubs up against it. Uh, and, and there's really nothing that I can say that is other than experience. You know, when you get to the point you've seen a you know, couple thousand cam plates and, and you know what problems can occur with this type of wear, it truly is just, uh, you know, visual and, and, a, uh, and to some degree is uh, visual and then physically measuring it. Um, they, you know, and then there's other things too, like when you look at piston skirts and how cylinders are wearing, there are certain ways that you can identify, maybe it's a, if it's a rod problem, if it's a, you know, an oiling system problem, if it's a temperature problem, discoloration, uh, pattern of the wear, maybe, a, you know, like for example, if, if uh, someone has, I had a recent job come in where a guy had just uh, uh, put on a big bore kit and the cylinders and, and the pistons were scarred up like crazy. Well, what I was able to identify when we took the engine apart was that the, the of course, the skirts were, had a significant amount of wear on them. And when you looked in the cylinder, they looked great at the top. And about halfway down the stroke, there was a tremendous amount of wear. And then at the bottom of the stroke, it looked great. So it was just this area in the middle. Well, my first question to the fellow was, uh, whoever bored and honed your cylinders, was it an automotive machine shop and did they use torque plates? reason I asked it that way, most automotive machine shops would not have torque plates for motorcycle cylinders. So come to find out, in fact, they did not have torque plates. So they just bored and honed his cylinders. When you put them in torque plates, the cylinder will typically open up, you know, or will open up and you can bore it to that. Well, when you do it without the torque plate, then it can be tighter when you and shrink back in and when you bolt it back together. So that's just another example. Marcel, I hope that answers the question you were asking there. All right, the next one comes from G Dubs Moto Adventures. Kevin, can you explain why exhaust choice seems to be more critical, uh, be a more critical factor uh, to reach max power and torque gains in M8 builds versus twin cam builds? Now, this is a fantastic question because uh, G Dub Moto Adventures, we are right in the middle of the series on M8 versus twin cam, and. Uh, I remember when the M8s first came out, if, well, let's go back a little bit further. If, if, if you remember, you know, twin cam Evo, that sort of thing, uh, every exhaust manufacturer sold their exhaust based on a dyno sheet. Uh, it was, you know, our exhaust with this air cleaner makes 10 more horse, 15 more horse. But if you notice, M8, as more exhaust companies started developing exhaust, virtually no one sells exhaust based on power numbers. All right, there's no dyno sheets because the exhaust, um, what they were finding is that when you change exhaust and air cleaner and put a tune on an M8, you don't see anywhere near the gains that you would see on a twin cam. And in some cases, more free flowing exhaust would actually produce considerably lower numbers. So one of the, the big reasons that that's the case, um, and, and G-Dub, I'm gonna say, reference the video that I did on twin cam versus M8 cylinder heads when we talked about valve area and we talk about port sizes. So it, a lot of that, you know, if you combine the two exhaust valve sizes uh, on an M8 head and then you look at the port volume, when you compare that, those two small valves to the one big valve that's in a twin cam, then there's a, it's like basically putting a huge exhaust valve in a twin cam. So a lot of it has to do with, with port velocities and things like that with, with the M8 head. But uh, on typically four valve engines and four valve heads are, are, are very, very efficient as well. And they like a lot of compression or cylinder pressure, if you will. So, 
you know, exhaust, I'd, I would never tell anyone on their M8 that, you know, if I pick a particular exhaust and we're talking a stock engine, you know, the particular exhaust, particular air cleaner, uh, you're not going to see anywhere near the gains on an M8 that you would have seen on twin cam and back. Where the things really start to change, we've got to get that cylinder pressure up and get that port velocity up. And the way you do that is changing the airflow in the engine, of course, with either cam compression, head work, and that sort of thing. So, G-Dub, I hope that helps. Next, uh, let's go to Cracker Jack. Hey, Cracker Jack, that's kind of funny. I think we all remember when the toys in a Cracker Jack box actually used to be awesome. Now you don't get anything. There's no more temporary tattoos and all that stuff that we used to get, and that just stinks. So um, Cracker Jack asks, I'd like to have a tech talk on addressing parasitic losses versus just adding horsepower and upgrading suspension for performance handling gains. Now, that's uh, also all great topics. Now, the uh, parasitic losses versus just adding horsepower. Um... That's kind of one of the, you know, I'm going to digress for a second. It's kind of one of the pros and cons when you start comparing turbos to superchargers. So if, if we're talking, uh, you know, let's talk big engines. Let's say top fuel dragsters. All right. So top fuel dragsters, now that they can actually measure it, they have dynos capable of it, um, that those engines are putting out, you know, 10,000 horsepower plus but they lose almost 2,000 horsepower just trying to drive the blower. So that's, uh, you know, it's 20%. That's a significant power loss, but it's required in order to make the, you know, the big number. Um, anyway, I digress on that for a second. That's kind of fascinating. You lose 2,000 horsepower for the very thing that is what's creating, helping to create the 10,000. Pretty amazing. But uh, anyway, yes, I, you, the, I've done a considerable amount of parasitic loss testing in, in drivetrain and, and engine, and of course it varies from one bike to the next. And an interesting thing, if we go back and we look at um, the pre-cruise drive transmission twin cams, so that's going to be, you know, 06 and earlier. When the 06 bikes came out, the cruise drive came in, the compensators got bigger and heavier, the automatic primary chain tensioners, various different things changed in that era from 06 to 07. And you could build the exact same engine, the exact same compression ratio, valve sizes, ports, cams, everything else on an 06. Doesn't matter if it's fuel injected or carbureted, but you could build the exact same thing on an 06 as you would build on an 07. But when you put them on a dyno, you'd see a 5 to 7% lower number on the 07. And that's because of all these parasitic losses, right? So from what I've seen in general, and you can look at this too, like if you compare, and you have to be careful with big manufacturers, the big manufacturer, advertising dyno numbers, which we all, I think, feel the same about dyno numbers, um, that they give you this advertised number. Most of the time, that number is at the crank. All right, well, then you factor in all your driveline parasitic losses, on average, I've found somewhere, depending on the gear that you're in, that there could be anywhere from about a 10 to a 17% parasitic loss across the entire system just from drivetrain and primary and things like that. Now, when we start talking about managing the parasitic losses from within the engine, I have to compare the gain to the cost. So what we're talking about when we're addressing internal engine parasitic losses, things like the valve springs, things like uh, valve to guide clearances, the type of piston rings that you use and the pull force uh, to pull the ring through the cylinder, whether it's low tension rings, high tension rings, how you gap the rings, your clearances on the cranks, all of that stuff, that, that has to do with parasitic losses. So if you were to address each one, I look at the cost to reduce that parasitic loss versus the gain that you would achieve. And what we end up talking about is spending a tremendous amount of money for very, very small incremental gains, okay? So you would, you would spend a tremendous amount of money to, you know, for a 5 to 7% parasitic uh, loss reduction versus the price of putting in a cam to overcome it. So... Um, 
Yeah, I've had several customers. Matter of fact, I do have a couple of bikes in here now that the goal is they're these are brand new 2020, well, and M8s. And the goal is not to produce a performance engine. The goal is to produce a perfect engine. So it's not a bunch of big compression stuff. It's not a bunch of big valves. It's not all that. It's about blueprinting the entire engine from top to bottom, reducing noise as much as we can, reducing parasitic loss, and then just peace of mind to fully blueprint this, this particularly stock engine. So Cracker Jack, I hope that helps you on, on my perspective on uh, parasitic losses versus adding horsepower. Um, let's see. Okay, and we got that one. Cody Long. Cody asks, when adding more power, how should braking be upgraded? What parts, pieces would be best to replace and upgrade? Uh, good question. Uh, so many of the parts, and, and I tell anybody this, if you've called me for a consultation and we're building a, a custom engine for you, excuse me, and we're building a custom engine for you, so many of the parts that I recommend to you are going to be based on how you're going to ride the bike. Uh, you know, we talk about clutch baskets, compensators, and, you know, the crank and how extensive the work needs to be. Much of that depends on you. You know how you ride your bike better than I do, but I know what damage can result or things that can be compromised uh, based off your riding styles, right? The same thing applies to brakes. Uh, the knee-jerk reaction is more power, ride faster, we need better brakes. Yes, that's true if you're actually going to be riding faster. Maybe your goal is to get from 0 to 60 as fast as you can and you really don't care about going any more than 70 or 80 miles an hour. So if that's the case, having a good healthy brake system is important, but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to run out and, and buy extremely expensive rotors and calipers and, and do drastic upgrades to your braking system in order to do that. But there are other things that can be done that will drastically improve your braking system and you get dual benefit. For example, suspension, which is going to be our segue into the next question. Uh, suspension plays, plays a huge role in braking performance. The better that the front end is, the more perfectly it's dialed in for your riding style and your weight, the bike will stop better. You'll get less dive and you'll maintain more control. So um, that's one of those things you can spend money on and get dual benefits from it and, and the increase in safety. So I wouldn't say if you add more power, you absolutely have to improve braking. It depends on whether or not you're going to ride faster. Good question, Cody. Next, Richard Kerrigan. Let's talk about the King of Baggers race. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, and what HD needs to do to compete with more technology advanced Indian, since competition drives innovation, what new features can we expect to see coming out of the motor company? This is a great question. And the reason I mentioned that one specifically is because I had a ton of people ask me why we weren't involved in the King of the Baggers race. Um, there's really no reason we weren't involved necessarily. I kind of wanted to sit back and see how this thing, whole thing was going to play out. It's... Uh, it's, it's interesting to see the race done that way. I, I think it was an awesome thing. You know, we've seen, uh, we've seen scoffers. You know, there's always trolls and things that have to beat everything down. I think it was pretty awesome. You know, I, I think it, it was something new, something different. And Lord knows this industry needs something new and different. Um, and to, to demonstrate that, yeah, these big heavy bikes can, can perform really well. But at the other side of it, it's an interesting thing. I mean, if, you know, NASCAR... Chevy wins on Sunday, they sell more Chevys on Monday, right? But let's see, maybe it'll come back. I think we're back. There we go, we're back. Everybody got it? How we doing? Good. Thanks, Sully. Good, we're back. Okay, perfect. Awesome. All right, so they, I'm not sure where where I lost you guys. Um, so on the, you know, these are hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollar motorcycles, man. I mean, it's the best of the best of everything that they could throw into them to make those bikes perform that the way that they did. Uh, there were a lot of custom one off parts that went into these things, you know, and so it's it's not your mom's Monte Carlo, 
You can't go to an Indian dealer, you can't go to a Harley dealer and expect to roll out and see those bikes do the same. But the one thing that I think everyone should draw out of the whole deal, um, let me back up for a second. You guys may remember the IROC races that were going on in the 80s and the 90s, where, you know, first, you know, they had an IROC Daytona series, they had the IROC Camaro series. Uh, the international race of champions and all that and the idea was every car had to be absolutely identical and it was truly a driver's race so um y you know it, everybody was on the same playing field well this you know not only is the rider important they obviously had some pretty gifted riders out there but these bikes were vastly different you know trash shows up with a 200 horsepower turbo bike indians limited to 108 cubic inches with a little bit of massaging but they could do anything i mean it was virtually wide open but they limited the indian i'm not at all surprised that an indian won not at all surprised um but what the, that whole race to me demonstrated is really just how important suspension is and uh you know how important it is for rake and trail and you know all, all the total aspects of the bike to make one go fast so it's not always about the power number unless you're going straight. So that was kind of the big thing. I hope that turns into a series. I would absolutely love to see it. Um, I love building performance baggers. We've build, been doing the performance bagger thing for years and years and years, you know, putting inverted front ends on them and uh, keeping the bag short, putting taller shocks on them. We've been doing that stuff for, for a very, very long time. And I love that. You know, it's... it's uh, I, I kind of like the idea of putting a, a blown big block in a in a station wagon. You know, that's what we're doing, and that's and, you know that's pretty cool. So I hope it turns into a series, and if it does, um, yeah, I see a Skunk Works bike in our future. Hint, hint. All right. So next, thanks, Richard. Good question. Next, Daryl Alsobrook. Uh, this is going to be Dorothy and Daryl. Good morning. Or good afternoon. Uh, is it better to upgrade with horsepower first or suspension? What do you think is more important? Just curious. Had someone ask me that. Just wanted your thoughts on it. Kind of goes back to what I mentioned before. Uh, a lot of it depends on how you ride. You know, if you're in you're in North Georgia, Tennessee, you're cruising around. You're not really carving canyons. You just want great acceleration, uh, reliable engine. By all means, start with the engine. Uh, suspension is definitely something to consider, you know, especially if you're riding two up a lot of times. As the bike makes more torque, as it feels better, you're going to get used to that additional power, and at some point you're going to use it. You're carrying a passenger on the back, having that suspension that you can rely on when you have to slam on the brakes, uh, I would almost say is equally important. Um, unfortunately, suspension is forgotten about uh, a lot of times, and people just focus on that power number. So if uh, it think, trying to think both total motorcycle is pretty important. And of course, uh, with yours, we're doing the engine and we're doing the forks and we're doing the shocks. So y'all got to kill two birds with one stone. Thank you very much. Uh, Joel Plow asks, at what point should you replace your crank? When should you have it balanced, pinned, and welded? Good question. Um, of course, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys, I see a lot of you that are in here, and uh, Sully, thanks a million, bud, uh, for the, your contribution there, man. I really appreciate that. Um, so, uh, the Dark Horse, you know, the Dark Horse video we did, it's a very long video and all that. So, it's, sometimes it's not a matter of time as to when you should replace it, it's a matter of condition of the crank itself. Uh, it's an interesting thing about cranks, you can't really check you know, physically measure the, the crank with the rod still on it. You pretty much have to take the thing apart. And a lot of it is by feel. So when you pull cylinders and heads off, and you can feel what the rear rod's like, and again, it's experience. It should have just a very, very slight amount of side-to-side -side movement on it. And the front one should be twice as much. Sounds crude, but that's about the best way to do it. And of course, when you put the, the at, at bottom dead center and top dead center, you roll it over, you grab the rod, and you pull up and down on it. There should be absolutely no play up and down. Um, but it's, you know, it's the total indicated run out thing. Cranks can slip, they can move, they can scissor, they can come out of true. So they can come out of the factory acceptable, but not ideal. So it's <coughs> at what point you should replace it. 
I can't put a time on it, man. I've seen I've seen cranks still good after a hundred thousand miles. The unpredictability is the issue. So uh, you know, if uh, you know, as an owner, if I had absolutely no problems with the bike, I'm one that I'd still pull. A, you know, if I'm at forty, fifty thousand, you know, fifty thousand miles, and uh, even as a conservative rider, I would probably open up the cam chest just to give me a chance to look at the tensioners, check run out, that sort of thing. Fifty thousand miles on a bike's a lot of miles. Uh, so hope that answers your question there. All right, let's see what's next. All right, Aaron Cox asks a very long question. He typed all kind of stuff, so I'm going to shorten uh, what he typed, uh, and uh, because this is, is also a very common question. Basically, he's he's looking at making some upgrades uh, to his M8. Uh, he's considering cam. He's considering exhaust or high flow tappet cuffs. Should he be changing lifters? Should I replace the oil pump first along with the cam plate, all this stuff. So basically what he's doing with this is trying to get my advice on where you should start when you're doing your upgrade. Uh, again, as I've said over and over, man, money is hard to make these days. Everybody works hard for it. I know you do. So do I. So um, sometimes it's, it's, and that's why when I talk to customers about when, when they want to talk about upgrades, I ask the question, give me an idea of your budget because I want to know your riding style and your budget. That's what helps me um, help you manage your budget, if you will, um, and, and try to determine what, what items that should be addressed for you and your, you know, your riding style, and also the current condition of the bike, right? I, I, the answer to a lot of this question, which thing should you do first? A lot of it depends on you. Okay, so let's say, for example, your biggest issue with the bike, you kind of like the performance, but it's the heat. You don't like the heat. All right, well, the way you get the heat out of it, you get rid of the catalytic converter, put a good set of mufflers on it, a good high flow air cleaner, and you tune the bike. That's going to cool it down. Maybe that's all that fits into your budget at that time, and that's perfectly cool. Uh, but that solves your problem. Okay, maybe you're okay with the heat. You just want more low end torque. All right, well, we know on M8s, changing the exhaust isn't really going to make a big power difference like we talked about before. So if you want to change the dynamic of the torque curve and move stuff around, the only way you can do that is to change the engine internally. And again, budget depends on a lot of that. So you change cams, right? Um, and it, as more budget opens up, you want more power. Of course, you can always do more. So a lot of how you choose to spend your money is, the, you know, the, um, uh, is what's important to you right? So I think our feed's still coming good. Yeah, the feed's still good. So we're doing great. So that depends, again, on you, a lot of that. Uh, many of the bikes are unpredictable, right? Um, all, all too often, you know, I see and hear uh, in emails I get and phone calls from people about things that their buddy told them or their shop told them or what the stuff. A lot of this, guys, we can't generalize these things. You know, you, you're an individual. The fact is, you know your motorcycle better than I do because you're the one that rides it every day. So when you have that kind of, I guess, intimate relationship with this motorcycle, you should be listening to the clicks and the, the little noises and the little, you know, just little nuances and things. And if you hear something that doesn't sound normal, if you hear a noise that's different, if the oil pressure is doing something a little different, or you know something is weird, something changed. So don't be satisfied with just the, oh, that's normal. There should be a certain amount of investigation put into that potential problem to see if in fact it is normal. Because again, you know that bike better than anybody. You wouldn't be standing in my shop telling me about a problem that you think you have on your bike if you didn't think it was a problem. Right, so it's my responsibility to either look at it, put your mind at ease, and, and solve the problem, or be able to explain why there's noise and ways to fix it. So that being said, where where do you start? That's really hard to say. We know that cam plates and oil pumps are a common issue, but there's hundreds of thousands of those motorcycles out there. How many of those bikes really have to have a cam plate and oil pump right now? You know, unless you have a problem, kind of a toss of the coin. Are compensators known issues? Yes. I've seen some garbage at 10,000 miles. I've seen some go 100,000 miles. All right, so a lot of that is, is checking and paying attention to the bike as to what things you should do first. 
there are certain characteristics as well. If you have an 07 or 08 model, I can tell you just about every 07 and 08 model, the compensators failed. 10, 20,000 miles, they were gone. We know that 07 models, they had very common issues with crankshafts. We know the 17 and early 18 model M8s, huge problems with cam plates and oil pumps. Uh, we talked about it on the video with the cylinders, you know, cracking and breaking. These are known common problems. So the answer to that question would also change based off of your specific bike. If you told me you had a 17, I would tell you, man, I would try to do the cam plate and oil pump first if it hasn't been done. Uh, I would also want to pull the cylinders to check the piston oilers to make sure they're not loose uh, and leaking oil there. Um, you know, if you, again, if you had an 07, I'd tell you, man, you need to check that crank. You know, we need to check that compensator. So it varies by year. All right, Aaron, thanks. That's a very good question. So let's start scrolling through the comments here, guys. Are we doing good so far? Everybody enjoying where we're at with this thing? Kind of like the format? Um, all right, give me a second to read through a couple things here. Uh, let me scroll up. Bear with me, guys. Um, F-Val, got you some fire water for the next trip down. You're the man. Uh, we did a Skunk Works 124 for him, and then he decided to go on a tour of the East Coast with that bike and has beat that thing to death and rode it and had fun with it. It's awesome. And he was kind enough to leave me a couple of beverages when he picked up his bike. That was fantastic. Uh, let's see. Uh, I have a question about exhaust. If you can answer, 88 motor died. I had D&D fat cat exhaust on it. Pick up SS124. Will this work? Or should I get the Borzilla? I, I would say, and that's coming from Danny Bryant. Danny, um, you could use the D&D fat cat. How you're going to know is how well that rear cylinder tunes in. If you use a fat cat on a, on a larger engine, sometimes your rear cylinder temperature will start to climb quite a bit. Rear cylinder head. But man, it's worth a shot. Try it and... Dial the bike in and see how it does. Don't spend money twice if you don't have to, man. Um, audio quality good, great. ECM codes, not maps for running the bike, but codes from the bike about issues. Oh, uh, let's see, ECM codes. I'm gonna see if I can come back to that one. Um, there may be a question down here somewhere. Uh, fill you on the readers. I had to start using them three years ago. You know, and I bounce back and forth from the 1.0s to the 2.0s. It depends on what I'm looking looking at. Um, Cracker Jack, Aaron, good deal. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, awesome, Dewey. Thanks, man. Appreciate you getting a T-shirt. Uh, what's an affordable two-in-one exhaust system to go in the SNS 475 cam and a Milwaukee 8? Is a catted exhaust better for street riding? Uh, I would always say if you can get rid of the catalytic converter, if you have made any engine modification. Uh, simply because you then have a better ability to tune the bike completely without worry of heating up the catalytic converter. Uh, the, uh, the alternative to that is to run it leaner so you don't burn up the, uh, the converter prematurely. You run it leaner and uh, it'll... So again, a lot of this is cooling the engine down. So you might not be able to cool the engine down quite as much if you kept the catalytic convertible in there, or convertible. A catalytic converter. That's kind of like my spark plug adapter and, and Cadillac converter story there. Um, an affordable one, you know, they vary in price range, man. I've seen them anywhere from, I think, 850 to 900 bucks up to twelve or $1,300. Exhaust is one of those things price matters. You know, the better chrome, better metal. Uh, so, but again, a lot of that's your budget, man. Whatever works for you. Um, uh, Reinhardt is a great choice. d and is a great choice. So you've got some good options there. Uh, Dewey did it. Preventing valve float. Yep. Referencing valve springs there. Absolutely. Important number. Um, uh, T-Man cams versus others. There's no videos on it. If you know any information on it, uh, get your opinion on that cam. Uh, not sure which cam. Uh, I, I don't necessarily talk one brand versus the other when it comes to cams. I use everybody's cams. Uh, I choose the cam after the build has been chosen that is perfect for that customer, their riding style, where they live. And uh, so it's to, for me, it's not about which cam is better than the other. It's which cam fits that owner the best. So uh, that's straight up my opinion on that. 
Uh, Harley doesn't give single number clearances. They give ranges of numbers, and you generally go for the middle number. Talking about measuring tolerances, that's exactly right. Unfortunately, they are production engines. They are not blueprinted. So, yeah, they don't get into the single-digit stuff, and they definitely don't live four zeros to the right of the decimal point like we do. So, uh, Kevin, what are your thoughts on going big board jugs and slugs without doing crank rods? I went to 107 to 124 without modification. Uh, flying low, that depends on your right hand, bud. Uh, I've, I've built several 124s and some 128s on the M8s without doing any crank work. I've done a lot of 107s. I've done a lot of 113s um, on stock cranks with the customer being warned. Uh, it all depends on your right right hand and did you get that you know a good crank man um so uh, again a lot of this stuff depends on your level of comfort and assurance um so that's that's really the answer there there's not a there's not a power number i guess i can put on that 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 depends on you um let's see uh awesome kev g dub you're welcome bud uh great torque plate explanation thank you philo Question for instance, here's from Dewey. Uh, 03 Twin Cam 88B with my build. We spoke about doing the 4-inch stroke 107. What point would someone need a larger throttle body uh, as put on stroker cranks 124? Throttle body choice, I can give you absolute de facto numbers as far as airflow dynamics on what throttle bodies are ideal for particular engine sizes. <coughs> Excuse me. And a big part of that is the RPM range you expect to run in. So if I were to say theoretically... If I were to build you a 120 cubic inch engine, a 50 millimeter throttle body is absolutely perfect. They tune in great. The port velocity is fantastic. The low to mid range torque is fantastic. Uh, it's 50 millimeter is virtually ideal till you hit the dyno. But who cares about dyno numbers? So, you know, for me, like my FXR back there, the FXR, it's 120 cubic inch, 11 to 1 compression, monster cam, all this stuff. That bike is going to make all the power I possibly need that thing to make by the time I hit 5,000 RPM. I'm not trying to get it to 7,000 RPM. So I put a 51 millimeter CV carburetor on it. I don't need anything bigger. It's ideal and it's perfect. But that also has a lot to do with gear ratios, how you're going to ride, where you're going to ride. So um, that, again, is part of that custom building consulting that we do, right? So um, a lot of times if, if someone, say, you know, $1,000 for a throttle body puts it outside your budget to build a 120 or a 124, I wouldn't let that stop you from building a 120 to 124. A 50 millimeter throttle body would work just fine on there. May not maximize the high RPM horsepower output, but who cares? Watch my video on why I think horsepower is overrated. Um, Mike Kellum just snagged a large shirt from you. Thank you very much, sir. The kids appreciate it, and so do I. Um, let's see, taper top connecting rods. Yeah, that's one of the big things, or the, the taper top connecting rods. You guys have seen the, the, uh, the videos on that. Having a square top rod, better piston stability, that's a big good reason to change a crank and at least do a Timken bearing conversion. So thanks, James. Uh... Let's see, Bob Kenny, Legend Suspension Covers, Suspension Performance. Very good video. Thank you, Bob. Uh, upgrading from stock M8 manifold to 55 millimeter manifold. Will polishing the manifold inside help? That's one of those things that's kind of up for debate, too, uh, Mike. That's We're talking incremental gains with some of this stuff. And it's um, almost these incremental gains from a tremendous amount of work. Uh, almost can't be measured or duplicated from one dyno to the other. Uh, is it a difference you would feel? Probably not. Most people can't feel 5 to 10 horsepower and torque difference. So as I think, and, and it kind of goes the same thing with, uh, there are certain engines that, yes, I would port, uh, or excuse me, polish the combustion chamber. Some engines I don't. It really depends on the use and the owner and what they're going to do with it. So good question there. Uh, let's see, what's got? Um, Mike, to intake polishing kind of hurts not due to aiding in the atomization. Yeah, Dewey, that's that's exactly right. I mean, polishing polishing intake ports went away a long time ago. Uh, and if you want to try this for yourself, I, I'll give you an idea. You take a piece of plexiglass, slick and smooth, spray it with water, with a mister, and then sand it. Make it rough, spray it with mister, and you'll notice the water sheet off instead of beat off. 
So you need to have some sort of texture. It creates a boundary layer of air and helps air move a little better, uh, especially with having fuel sliding through there. It's better to have a little bit of a texture. Polishing intake ports, um, it's really not something that's done unless you're talking wide open throttle stuff. So yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, slip on power to 04 Heritage. Sorry guys, trying to get through all of these. Um, what's your opinion on V-twin cooling options? I installed a set of lug jobs. I'm thinking about a new oil pan and or an oil, a new oil cooler. Uh, Lou, I tell you, I'm I'm a fan of less gadgets and tune it right. I for somebody that does a lot of city riding and things like that, I I will recommend the Jag uh, fan assisted oil cooler just because I consistently see 40 degree cooler oil temps using the Jag oil cooler. Uh, the fans and all that stuff, I, man, unless a guy's a Shriner or something and does a ton of parades and sits in a ton of traffic, with the bikes that we build and tune, I've never seen a need for any of the other peripherals like that. They stay cool enough. But a lot of times I can also change how I tune the bike. I can run a little bit richer at idle and, do, and change ignition time and all that to manage engine temperature for that individual. So uh, if it's something that you think you need, it's not going to hurt anything. So... Jump in there and give it a shot, man. Uh, let's see. Uh, two and a half hours, two and a half trash, I think close to stoic with minor carb adjustment. Uh, that would be a guess, Sully. Uh, I'm really not sure on that, man. I, I don't like guessing on this type of stuff. Uh, I, and when anytime it comes to compression ratio, or excuse me, to uh, air fuel ratios, there's no substitute for having that sucker checked. Let's see. Uh, buffering, buffering. I think we got the buffering stuff fixed. Uh, okay, there we go. We're back. Everybody's back. Um, Tyler Sprocket, even. Please explain if it really works. External breather system. Okay, that's actually a good question. Uh, Juan asks, could you please explain if it really works to place an external breather system on Harley Davidson motorcycles when you disassemble the engine? Do you find a lot of carbon deposits? Uh, the, the more, that's an easy answer, Juan, the more you can help that engine breathe, the better. So, uh, and also getting the crank breather external of the throttle body, it only helps. It keeps all of the contamination from getting on intake air temp sensors and map sensors and all that stuff. So, yeah, you can bend it externally. It works perfectly fine. Uh, Sully, thanks again for, thanks again, buddy, for popping 10 bucks in there, man. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, best to upgrade... The plate on my 03 motor, cooked I-65, oil pressure plummeting, cost me seven grand. I don't miss stock motor. Uh, exactly, Dewey. You got it. Uh, plate and pump. You were a victim. Let's see. I'm going to crank those sounds beginning to fail. That's a good question, Travis. What should I ex be expecting for an early indication that the crank on my 07 Ultra is beginning to fail? Still stock with 30,000 miles. A lot of times you don't know till it's too late, but pay attention to the engine vibrations. That's a big thing. So pay attention to any change in engine vibration, and uh, that's that's a really, really good indicator. Uh, any noises that are coming up from the bottom end that you didn't hear before, especially when it's cold, that's a good thing to look for as well. Uh, and uh, that that's really your two indications without pulling primary cover and cam cover. Uh, Remus upgraded to mechanic. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate your support. Uh, yes, I know about hydraulic tenters. Still use plastic shoes, and they will wear no matter what. Geared cams is a better option. James, I agree. Uh, they do wear, but as you know, sir, uh, it's not quite as much pressure on the chain as, as it was with the spring tensioners. They do last longer, but yeah, they do wear. Uh, Michael Riggin. Uh, in 128M8 with stock heads, which do you prefer? Smaller injectors with long pulse or larger injectors with short pulse? Larger injectors. The, and it, a lot of it has to do with the ECM's ability to actually switch in pulse. So I'm even finding in stock M8s with just cam upgrades that the stock injector isn't switching fast enough at low RPM and just off idle. And it creates a little bit of a hesitation that virtually can't be tuned out. It's just not switching fast enough. So uh, could it be an ECM limitation or what? I'm not really sure. I hadn't figured that out yet. But I'm starting to put in larger injectors with just cam upgrades. And man, the off-idle, the bikes just tune in better and they run a lot better. 
Um, plus, we want to run, uh, you know, we want to try to keep, you know, pulse width, if we possibly can, under, you know, 80, 85%, or excuse me, duty cycle, 85 to 90%. You can stretch it to 100 in small areas, but I'd rather not do that, I guess. Um, can you do a review on an oil cooler sometimes, Danny? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, it's, I think it's widely known. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the JAG stuff, have been forever, and uh, it, it works fantastic. We were actually involved with JAG in the very beginning on uh, putting a fan on that oil cooler. This goes back 12, 14 years ago, at least, in testing those things. But, uh, yeah, I can do a review. I've got a few videos out there that I mentioned that cooler, but maybe that's a good idea, man, um, to do a do a thing on that. Let me see if there's a way I can mark that. Um, all right, perfect. Let's see what we got next, guys. How are we doing so far? I think we're jumping in here. Oil cooler for M8. Uh, let's see. Cheaper to do a skunk works build one supposed to doing cheaper to do to just do a let's see Chris Caswell asks is it cheaper to just do a skunk works build once as opposed to doing cams then jugs then crank it it is now when when we design our builds I I try to do it with stages in mind and again we're we're custom we do everything in house here so if someone for budgetary reasons or whatever has to do the build in stages then we can cater those stages along the way. Uh, to so that you all you know parts will complement each other. So if we did just a cam for somebody, later on we we would pair up the right piston and cylinder. Then later on they could do heads. So yeah, that's totally possible for us to do that. The there is no question you will spend more money on the labor side of things because you have to tear it down again, you have to tune it again. But if you start at the bottom and work your way up, the double that you're having to pay on the labor is less. So that's a that's a really good question. Let's see, Ner Nerigis, I think that pronounced right. What about torque-based electronic throttle control on new bikes? How to tune them? It's a trial and error thing, man. Um, that technology goes way, way, way back. Um, I was doing stuff with Delphi. Uh, it's 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 a tr it's a trial and error deal. And if if it the system on on the motorcycle side of things is not perfected yet, but it it is on the automotive side, you can truly watch live active ECM stuff, performance data, and, and adjusting throttle plate live while you're doing pulls and, 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 and get that throttle plate dialed in just right. Well, it's not quite to that technology yet on the motorcycle side, but hopefully that's coming soon. Uh, Isaac, you going to post this after live? Yeah, it's going to stay up. Uh, it'll stay up. Y'all can review it. I'm probably going to go in and I'll change the thumbnail to try to cover some topics or something. So... More people will hop in and take a look at it. Uh, so yeah, it'll it'll still be up. Eider sprocket, Eider sprocket cam chain tensioner. The springs would be a non-issue, and the plastic shoes would be longer. You know, I'm going to touch on this for a second. Jeff Moore, uh, thank you very much, sir, for the ten bucks, buddy. I appreciate you very much. Anything that y'all put in here is going to my charity, uh, every bit of it. So I, I appreciate your support for that. So let's uh, the the cam tensioner thing. That's probably, that's something I keep hearing over and over and over again is why not put gear on the back of the cam and chains on the front or gears on the front of the cam and chains on the back. I understand the cams would have to be made completely different. You can't just put a gear in a chain because when you're running chain to chain, your cam, the rear cam, is turning in the same direction as the crank. Well, if you then have to put a gear between the two cams on the back, now that cam has to be ground in reverse because now it's gear to gear. Well, if you do the opposite, you put the gears on the outside, crank's moving this way, this cam's going to be moving this direction. Then if you put the chain in the back, this the front cam has to be ground to move in the same direction as the rear one. So it's you're talking having to completely regrind cams opposite and all this stuff. Now where it comes into play is when you start having cams that have a lot of lift on it, you're... Actually, base circle has to get very, very, very small because it becomes a clearance issue between the lobes on a twin cam. So the lobe clearance becomes an issue. So then you have to make the base circle smaller and smaller and smaller so that the lobes have, have clearance. So I actually had a customer one time call me that said uh, we, we, his cams were made wrong. And he went to gear drive. And I asked, why is it made wrong? And he says, well, the, one, the, the cam is reversed. The lobes are backwards. Well, it's gear. Gear to gear, gear to gear. So, you know, to do the... To, 
it's really not, but no one's going to gear up and, and just start making, you know, cams opposite directions and opposite grinds and stuff uh, to do that. It, it would be a quite a big undertaking, but uh, cool nonetheless. But we'll see. Uh, would a 55 millimeter manifold work well with a 468 cam intake stock heads at 107? You know, I, uh, uh, yes, it would because you have, you know, electronic throttle plate. You may have to keep the throttle plate closed just a little bit, keep the port velocity up. Uh, it would work. I can tell you, I would probably keep, personally, I would keep a stock manifold, uh, with, with just a, a cam upgrade. Uh, that's me personally, and that's going to keep, and if anything, I would like to make them smaller to get a lot more throttle response early, uh, in the RPM range. But, um, yeah, so I, if I were doing a cam, I pro just a cam, I probably wouldn't recommend to somebody just, you know, putting a manifold on it too, unless we were doing a really, really big build. Uh, Daryl, thank you. Joined as a member, as an apprentice. Thank you very much. Uh, Khalil asks, am I sponsored? No, sir, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sponsored, uh, by anyone at this point. Uh, when we do product reviews, I buy the products. Uh, those products are not given to me. When we do the, you know, the wizard stuff and things like that, um, I, I get offers to do all sorts of different things. And if I don't like the product and I don't think it's good, I don't think the marketing material is valid or viable, then we just don't do it. So, um, so there, would I, would I do some sponsorships? Absolutely. I would provided it was a product that is a good product value and a good partnership with the organization. Otherwise, no, nah, I'm not going to do it just to do it. Um, let's see, uh, sorry guys, trying to get to all of them. What is my preferred, that's a good one, Michael Riggin. Thank you, uh, Michael's a, a member as well. What is your preferred transmission fluid in a stock M8 transmission? I feel the same about this that I do with the twin cam in the, in the cruise drives and the five speeds. Uh, it's uh, either, you know, the, the 20, uh, tw running a 2050 synthetic is okay, I prefer to run an 80W90, and typically what I will tell people is maybe run, you know, run the 2050 when the bike's new, let the transmission kind of get broken in a little bit, uh, or if you have a high mileage transmission, I kind of, it's to the same, or if even if you have a new one, you switch it over to 8090 and it, the transmission will shift a little softer, feel a little softer, be a little less clunkier, and then typically with it, like if you run an 8090, you really only need to change that gear oil every 10,000 miles, not every five uh, like you see, so 8090 under extreme conditions, I would probably be more likely to recommend like a, a 9140 uh, to someone in a in an Amsoil severe gear is what I I run personally. So my FXR with the five speed that I'm going to be beating to death, that's going to have a 140 weight severe gear street bike. I'm going to run an 80W90 or a six speed or a seven speed from Baker. The the cruise drives all that stuff. That that would be what I would run. Good question. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Khalil, man, you're a nice guy, piggy, one-eyed asshole. Tell you what, let's do this. Boink. There you go. We're not going to worry about him anymore. He's gone. Uh, let's see. Best way to torque oil pumps on M8s for best alignment pinion shaft. Seeing lots of wear on M8 pumps when the runout is low. 11 Rustin, thanks for being a member, bud. Uh, I... You guys remember the alignment pins back in the day, right? That you used with uh, the early twin cams. And then they changed that method in 07 with the hydraulic plates. And uh, so the way that I do it is I will slowly, basically on, on and, and I do it with hand, I don't do it with a ratchet. So I'll use a, 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 a driver and get the plate right up to the pump, right? And rotate the crank and then slowly after you do a couple of revolutions, I'll go a couple more turns, a couple more revolutions, and work that in there. And when I get it basically where I'm, you know, I'm, I know I'm touching and I know I'm solid, you know, maybe a 20, 30 inch pound type of thing, I'll rotate it a few more times and then, uh, you know, add about 40 inch pounds and start working my way around. I think the torque on that's 110, 120 inch pounds, something like that. So, you know, and, and just slowly rotate it multiple times while it's being tightened. I found that's going to be the best way to do it, and I've never had an alignment issue. I don't use the pins anymore. Um, 
Thrown in a bottle of Captain Morgan. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, let's assume one is content with an M8 Stage 2 power. What are the items you would take care of short of building the bottom end? Uh, I would, uh, good question, Brian. I would, uh, that goes back to the assurance, man. It's, uh, and the year model of the bike. The stock cam plates and oil pumps got a little better on the newer models. I still don't trust them because I still see problems. But I would look at the items that would cause the most damage uh, if they failed. All right, so let's let's start with those. And and you know if a compensator fails, it's you're going to know ahead of time and be able to take care of it. Typically, you know you're going to it's going to be difficult to find neutral. It's going to be banging around stuff like that. Things like cam plates and oil pumps are a whole different story. Uh, things like cut clutch baskets they can fail. So. I, I, I guess I would look at it like that. Um, get more power 103 Dynas, uh 57H cam. Uh, get more power on a 103. It's cam. Then you just start working with heads and cylinders, man. It's all about compression and, and airflow dynamics. That's where the power comes from. Uh, let's see. Uh, on a two grand budget, what would you do? You know, with that, uh, what I would probably do um i would probably do like a a 107 get the compression up do it with pistons and cylinders uh then if if i were doing it i would i guess you could say blueprint do a custom head gasket get the quench down on the piston really uh, get it down really tight uh for two grand you could do that piston cylinders handle that get the bike tuned really well that would be a pretty significant bang for the buck uh on a on a two grand budget that's probably the route i would go Causes of crank run out. Good question. Um, how they're manufactured is a big part of it. Manufacturing tolerances. Some are worse than others. Uh, how the the how the bike's being used. If you do real hard D cells, real hard accelerations, the crank can slip like that. It can also scissor like that. Uh, you also have uh, problems with concentricity with clutch basket and clutch hub. Uh, in the primary, the automatic primary chain tensioner ratcheting up too tight can pull on the sprocket shaft over time. You know, there's a lot of dynamics going on in there. Uh, so those are and and your right your right hand, how hard you hit it, you know that that can cause crank run out too. But in in most cases, a lot of it is simply manufacturing issues. Uh, let's see, uh, Mark Miller, switch fans. Mark Miller, 05 Road Glide with SNS 510 cams. Runs bad when switched to Vance and Hines slip ons. Uh, have a power vision without O2 sensors. Uh, it's it's probably a tune thing, man. Uh, if if you make a if if you make a change like that and you change change exhaust, you change something like that, and you notice immediately that there's a difference. Uh, it could be anything from an exhaust leak or it's just the tune is that far off. So maybe take a take a look at that. Uh, Chris Castle, don't let the trolls bother you. Hundred people in here taking up your words as gospel. Hey, Chris, dude, I don't worry about it, man. I don't sweat it at all. Thank you for saying that. Um, anyway, hey, hey, you know what? It's the way I look at it. I look at some of the thumbs down on the videos and some of the comments and stuff like that. If you know, if the comments are nasty and people are saying something that's just absolutely ignorant or stupid, I don't want there to be any confusion. So I don't put those comments up, but. A lot of these folks that uh, put the thumbs down, they don't realize they're giving me help, man. It's an interaction. It's an engagement. So thumbs it down all you want. I don't really care. I don't, I'm not going to change what we're doing. Um, actually, I, I digress for a second. My wife tells me that I always have to be right. And I say, no, honey, I don't always have to be right. But I'm right until you show me a better right. When you do, I'll change my way of thinking. <laughs> That's pretty good, right? Uh, let's see. Um, thanks, Danny. Appreciate you, bro. Fist bump. Uh, Thomas, kick back on hot starts. Could be ignition timing. It could be too much compression. It could be cylinder pressure issue. It could be starter issue. Uh, that could have been caused by the other things that I mentioned. Uh, ignition timing, that sort of stuff. Um, could be a little bit too lean. Could also be a compensator issue. So I know that's quite a few things there, but that's going to be it. Um... Let's see. Cracker Jack, I'm in the Tennessee area, but uh, Twist Hunt having a 114 M8. It's got plenty of power to get into trouble and tight technical stuff. Suspension is my priority before doing power 
mods. Now I'm going to, I'm going to say this guys, before you do, before you do, if you're interested in ordering any suspension stuff, we've got stuff on our website. Don't order it off our website. Call me, email me. Um, we've got some stuff we can do on suspension that is pretty dang awesome. So, um, yeah, so if we do suspension, we can do suspension stuff just as custom as we can the engine stuff for about the same price as the off the shelf stuff. Uh, Black Dog, 10 bucks. Thank you, sir, for helping the kids, man. I really appreciate it. How tall can a cam can you run with stock springs? Uh, you know, Michael, I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, I, I, I haven't for myself measured coil bind uh on on the spring but i can tell you a lot of that has to do again with uh the, you know the actual shape of the cam lobe right and valve float and all that stuff uh, and i think the cam lobe is going to determine a lot of that too and i just i haven't looked at that yet because i'm typically not a put a put the biggest cam that i can put in one guy but if i'm not mistaken it's going to be probably somewhere around 520 or 530 if i had to guess all right uh, don't take that as gospel. I'm I'm thinking on that one. Uh, fueling is promoting the use of conventional motor oil and M8s. Have you a position on this suggestion by fueling? I'm I've already planned on next week talking to fueling about that to find out exactly why. I know I have my opinion now, and like I said a second ago, actually, um, I feel like I'm right on my way of thinking unless somebody can show me a better right. And I would be, um, obviously, there's some smart guys at fueling. There ain't no question. And I don't want to, by any means, dismiss um, that as, as something to listen to. So I'm going to do my due diligence and come back to you guys and let you know on that. But before I form my opinion, I want to talk to fueling and find out their information on that. So I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Good question. Um, let's see. Uh, kick back on hot starts, same thing. Mentioned that before. Look at your ignition timing, starter, uh, ignition delay. There's some, uh, I do some custom programming on some ignitions that people buy from us that helps to, if not completely eliminate that, help a lot. But double check battery voltage while cranking, ignition timing, that sort of thing. Uh, that'll help you there. Any suggestions on lowering a bike? Uh, yes. Um, there's definitely some ways that I wouldn't do it. But I would want to talk to you specifically if you would send me an email about where you ride and that sort of thing because there's some considerations that may be there. Uh, you know, for adjustability, you don't always want a lowered bike. I'd, I would like to know why you want to lower the bike to see if before I would just, you know, spurt out information there. Uh, you're welcome, Mark. Uh, that's why Dark Horse is in the books. You got it, Dewey. And uh, Carrie Lewis, thank you very much for the kids. 20 bucks means a great deal, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot more on importance of proper quench. Steve Hastings, that's a good... You know what? That's a very, very good topic. Let me talk on this one for a second. This, this is kind of a... Uh, hops into engine blueprinting. So what quench is, it basically is the distance between the piston and the head. The reason that it is called quench is because there's a certain amount of space that you technically can't have combustion. Now, there was when internal combustion engines came around many, many years ago, they figured out a couple of interesting things. When you get combustion propagation and you have a flame front around the perimeter of the piston, very, very close to the, 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 the cylinder wall, if you have combustion pressure there, the engine is more likely to detonate and damage the edge of the piston. So one of the ideas is to quench the flame front on the outer edge of the piston and try to concentrate that flame front more in the center of the piston than in the center of the combustion chamber. All right, so they call it quench because it kind of quenches combustion in that area. Now there is a theoretical ideal point that you want to be at. And that theoretical point is 30 thousandths of an inch. That's not very much. 30 thousandths of an inch is only about like that. And when you got a piston moving 4,500 feet per minute at 6,000 RPM on a 4 and 5 eight stroke, that is screaming. So 30 thousandths of an inch isn't that much. If you can get it to 30 thousandths of an inch, uh, now, in order to do that, though, I'm going to caution you, you got to have a good piston. You got to have a good rod. You got to have a good crank. Everything's got to line up. Everything's got to be good to run it that tight. Um, most builders will run 40 
uh, stock Harleys are in the 50 to 60 range, uh, which is very broad, which is why a lot of them detonate regardless of where your ignition timing is set because that quench is too tall. A uh, quench is a very, very important aspect and one of the key aspects when we blueprint one. So that's why when I sometimes we get delayed quite a bit on doing a, a blueprint engine build because the crank's got to be perfect. I've got to get the crank in the case, measure the case, measure the cylinders, make sure everything's perfect there and all of those tolerances stack up and that final one of the final numbers I'm looking at is where that piston sits relative to the deck of the cylinder and also what that clearance is going to be to the head. And I don't really like cutting cylinders to get that number. I would prefer to do it with custom head gaskets. So I will sometimes at the last minute, I get to that final point and it's crap. You know, I need a, a head gasket that's a couple of thousandths thinner, a couple of thousandths thicker. And uh, so that can put a cease to a build right there and we have to order gaskets. So yes, that is very, very important. And uh, let's see. Uh, so great. Yeah, great one, Steve. Thanks for that. Uh, stock cranks, low quality from HD. Hate to say such thing. The aftermarket stuff should be. Yeah, that's entirely true, James. How many people got? 110 viewers, man. That is awesome, guys. You guys are great. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mike Kellum, 20 bucks helping me help the kids. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if you guys are interested, if you want to learn more about the, the charity that I started, 3tsports.com. The number three, the letter T, sports.com. And uh, there's a bunch of videos in there, too. And, of course, there's a, a 3T Sports uh, YouTube channel as well. I do in-depth interviews, talk to the parents and the therapists and doctors with all these kids and stuff when we help them out with these adaptive bicycles. So if you'd like to see where your money's going, check out the website. Now, hopefully next year all this crap will be evened out and I'll, I'll feel better physically. And I'm going to go back to doing uh, some Ironman races and, and Ironman training and uh, to raise more money for those kids. So guys, thank you very much for doing uh, for helping me out with that. Uh, it is a 100% charity. I feel the importance to say that. Uh, I actually cover, I cover all of the operating expenses for it personally, you know, credit card fees and things like that. I cover all that personally and 100% of your donation goes to help the kids. So, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Brian Norwell, thank you very much. Uh, uh, $10 Canadian. Man, thank you. Uh, what fuels have you ran? E85 or methanol? What's your thoughts? Uh, you know, I've I, I actually I did a video. I think I put it down in the description on E85 is cheap race gas. That's exactly what it is. It's 100 octane, give or take. Uh, so it's yeah, it's cheap race gas. You just have to burn it all. You can't let the stuff sit around for a while. And of course, you have to nearly double the size of the injectors. The ignition timing is totally radically different. A lot of people don't know how the E85 vehicles work. Oh, and you will consume more fuel. Uh, E85 is nowhere near as efficient. It doesn't carry as many BTUs and such as regular gasoline does. So, uh, you know, it's far less efficient uh, for vehicles that have flex fuel, things like that in it. You actually have an ethanol sensor in it. So when you switch from regular gasoline to E85, the sensor sees how much is in it, immediately adjusts the ignition timing, changes the pulse width on the injectors, and you will see a 10 to 15 percent loss in fuel economy when you do that. Is it cheap race gas? Sure, man. You can run E85 in race cars, and I've you know I've ran it in bikes before and all that. But it's got to be tuned for it. Bigger injectors, sometimes bigger fuel pumps, and definitely a lot of tuning to get it right. Uh, Jeff, thanks for coming in, bud. Have a good one. Uh, let's see. Uh, cause of engine dieseling after shutoff typically air fuel ratio. Air fuel ratio and ignition timing. If the timing is uh, too far. Well, I've actually seen it do it if it's advanced or retarded way too far. But most of the time, it seems to be an overly rich fuel mixture. Uh, Lou, thank you very much. $20, sir. Um, I have to lower the bike because I'm only four foot nine inches tall. That's a pretty good one. Um, all right. So with that, don't just think about lowering the bike. Look at your seat height, the width of the seat, uh, that's a good thing. Consider the shoes that you're wearing, boots uh, with heels on them. That'll help you as, as well. Uh, we should probably talk directly about that. What I would probably do, Remus, is is have you a custom set of fork uh, gas cartridges and shocks made because we want to try to get you as much travel as we can with the suspension so it doesn't bottom out. 
but we also want to preserve the ride quality. So if you'll shoot me an email, Kevin at Pro Twin, we should probably have a conversation on that one. But think total bike. Think your boots. Think the seat, the width of the seat, not just the height of the seat as well. Uh, let's see. Um, why are there so many sportsters with stator problems? Could it be the wrong oil that affects the varnish that covers it or something similar? Well, I'm not, I'm not aware of a common problem with sportster stator, staters. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any common problems with that at all, so I can't answer that question, bud. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. Let's see, Cracker Jack. Look at the yeah pre tech talk posting questions. I actually, asked the E eighty five question. Yeah, perfect. Uh, that, I actually did a video on that, but I think we covered the the question on that. So thanks, Cracker Jack. Hey, Ron. Ron made it. Hey, Ron. How you doing, buddy? Moderators to help. Uh, do we thought about getting some moderators to help on trolls or spammers? Uh, honestly, that uh, that jerk off that was just in there, pathetic soul, was the first one I've ever had. Um, and that's fine. It's pretty easy for me to reach up there and click the button and make them go away or just simply ignore them. Uh, I think it's funny that they don't have anything else better to do that he didn't. He's been the only one. I don't really care. So uh, <laughs> that he didn't have anything else better to do than to jump on and say some stupid crap like that. I love it. Gotta love people, right? Um, I'll help you out. Maybe we can do that, Dewey. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Flathead, uh, on the trap range, man, how did you do? Um, sporting clays, all that type of stuff, I'm guessing. Um, haven't done that in a long time. I need to. Let's see. What else have we got? How do you determine your quench, or how would I determine my quit, my quench? Uh, I, I think I understand your quench. You have to physically measure it. So, uh, I mentioned a second ago, and that question may be late. It's all, it's measuring it. Stacking the engine together, considering all your gasket thicknesses, gasket crush, all that type of stuff, and you just have to measure it. And that's really the only way to do it, is while you're assembling the engine or while you're taking it down. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm 5'6", and I struggle to reach the kickstand. Yeah, I do too. I'm 5'9", and I, have, I struggle with that. Uh, I got those little extender things that, you know, you can put on the tip of it. They're not that attractive, but hey, if you can't find your kickstand, you kind of have to have it. So at some point, there's there's a function over form, I guess, right? Let's see. What grit? Josh McKinney, what grit honing pads? How to plateau hone? That is determined by the finish required for the rings that you're running. There is no de facto answer on that. Uh, it's all about the rings, not only the hone angle. It's uh, You have basically uh, an RA and an RMS finish that's kind of like frequency sound wave. So it's depth of the scratch, width of the scratch, frequency of the scratch, all that type of stuff. Um, that That's really determined by the ring, the ring manufacturer and the ring material. How to plateau hone? That's done with a very, very soft stone or with plateau honing brushes. Typically at around a 600 grit, give or take. Some run at 4, 450. It all depends on what the scanner tells you when you scan that cylinder looking for that desired RA and RMA, RMS finish on that final. So, yeah, we do get that anal retentive when we board and home cylinders. So, hope that helps you, sir. Um, did you have a motor in the King of Baggers? No, sir, I didn't. But uh, let's see if they make it a series they do we might have to go play with them boys uh let's see i'm not worried about fuel economy uh, i can carry over seven gallons on my bike good lord man g does probably better to consider a bike with a lower stock seat height if you need to lower it that much to be comfy g dub i i kind of agree with you he's referencing back the fell i think he said that he was uh four foot nine um yeah seat everything else take a look at it <coughs> excuse me yeah, uh, let's see what else we got. Um, does anyone make an injector that puts out the volume you need for E85? Yes, sir, we do. Uh, I can basically go up to the biggest injector that I've gotten so far was 18 grams per second that I had made, uh, and we can get those done, and they're not ridiculously expensive either. I think. Um, Three, around 375 give or take for blueprinted flow matched 
Uh, I can even give you, you know, what the flow rate is at different voltages and, and all of that type of stuff uh, with, through the blueprint deal. So, uh, yeah, I believe 18 grams per second is the biggest I've went. I may be able to go bigger on that. So, yes, that's plenty big enough for E80, E85 with a ton of power. What we experience, Brian asks, what will we experience removing the balancer off my M8? Is it even worth it? You know what? It is. Uh, I'm not, now, let me rewind a second. I'm not going to say you have to do it. Definitely not. I, and I can't really say that there's any cons to it. Now, I wouldn't tear a bike down specifically just to remove the balancer. I wouldn't do that. And I would only remove the balancer if it had a perfect crank in it. And I mean perfect. Balanced. Perfect. Um... And what you what basically what happens is is at idle you may feel a little bit additional vibration at idle, but what I'm finding is really at RPMs at higher RPMs and highway speeds, a lot of cases the engine's a heck of a lot smoother without the balancer in it. So if uh, it's again it's one of those things that's up to the owner. If somebody's more of a lower speed around town rider, I'll say you know if you're not riding 80 miles an hour all the time. Maybe leave the balancers in. It does rob a little bit of power, no question. But if, you know, doing a case up build, something like that, you can yank those balancers out too. Uh, let's see. Um, 85 on my Skunk Works build for sure. All right. Things have changed. Good deal, Dewey. 35 years ago, we didn't finish hone with a ball hone. We called it plateau hone. That was MMI who taught it. Oh, yeah. I don't finish hone with a ball hone either. Uh, oh, okay. I think you're saying you did finish with a ball hone. Yeah. So, um, sorry, Ron, I got confused there. Um, yeah. And really the only thing that's changed is, is just the, the technology. I mean, of course, yeah, you can do it with the ball hone with the plateau brushes now and getting the real fine grits. Um, yeah, a lot of, to a large degree, man, these things are tractor engines. So, you know, that stuff works too. Um, Michael Reagan, are you familiar with revolutions? Uh, carbide line cylinders. Yeah. Um, send me an email on that one. Uh, I, I don't, I would prefer, you're welcome to email me, sir. I'll be glad to answer that question. Um, and not here <laughs> and I'll just smile on that. Uh, when considering injection pulse time and flow, how do we determine if we need larger injectors? Uh, when it comes down, well, you know, duty cycle and, and you can actually kind of see it when you're tuning, depending on your tuning system. Uh, when you start, uh, getting to a point of getting, 95 and it depends on how large of an area too you're hitting a 95 percent duty cycle 100 percent duty cycle then you're overtaxing the injector a little bit the challenge with choosing injector size you can't go you don't want to go too big because then you end up you know having to run either a very high idle uh or you know the injector is more puddling than it because it can't switch fast enough things like that so there's that happy medium in between but when you start getting above uh I try to get no more than about 85, but it depends on the build. Um, 90, 95% duty cycles. When I I'd pretty much kind of tap it out. Let's see. Um, 2019 M8 uh, upgrade SNS oil pump. Which cam should I replace the jugs and pistons? Seen a couple video failures on the M8. Yeah, we did a we we did a video on that too. Um, why do you know why are the cylinders breaking? Uh, I, it was extremely common on 17s, early 18s. I'm not seeing it happen as much on the 19s and 20s. I still don't trust it. Um, for the cost of a set of cylinders, considering the price of a full custom engine build, I, I would change the cylinders on mine, and I recommend that my customers do too, because if that skirt breaks, it's a catastrophic failure. Uh, but the, the truth of it is uh, that... I don't see as many now as I did then. Something changed, and I'm still working on that. But anyway, that's my take on that. Um, let's see. Saw a video, dark horse crank. The dude stood a nickel upright, stayed at idle for a good minute till he revved it up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's smooth, man. Richard Alvis. Hello from Savannah, Georgia. Gear heads for sure. Man, I haven't been to Savannah in a long time. Um... Love Savannah. It's a great place. I just haven't been there in a really, really long time. Uh, get old Dingleberry home. Let's see, James. Can you spread the floorboards on a stock bike and remain safe? I can't seem to get comfortable. My shoes always feel like they're slipping. Um, you know, lean angle. 
You know, I mean, yes, you can. You can put uh, you can put spacers underneath the floorboard mounts and longer bolts down there, but uh, you know, it's the lean angle. Just make sure the uh, just make sure the floorboards can still pivot in case you you know hit the hit the ground on that, of course. Cylinder glazing from Josh McKerney. Cylinder glazing, what to look for? Exactly that. Uh, you see the missing of a cross hatch. You see discoloration in the cylinder. Uh, it'll look smooth. It'll look glossy. Um, and as far as what to look for, the symptoms is excessive blow by, uh, loss of cylinder pressure, excessive leak down. Uh, those are things to look at. As far as what causes it, man, that could be a lot of stuff. It could be overheating. It could be poor piston to cylinder fit from the beginning. Uh, overheating is a big one. Oil breaking down, oil viscosity could be a part of it. Um, if you have a lot of, uh, if you have a lot of skirt clearance in there, then it can actually roll the piston rings a little bit on the side and polish the cylinder and grind off that uh, cross hatch. So that's another thing to take a look at. Let's see. Who else have we got? <laughs> Dog training collars by Red League. Dewey says it'll help him with spam, then spams him three times in 10 minutes. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Dewey's a friend, but I, okay, Dewey, you got to laugh on that one, buddy. That was awesome. <laughs> oh, man, that was funny, funny. I love it. I love it. All right, uh, Wishbone, got to run, Kev. Th hey, thanks, Wishbone, for joining us, bud. Um, I think I'm going to ask a couple more questions, guys, and then we've been on now for an hour and a half. So uh, let's see who what last question or last question here. Uh, stock, uh, stock 2010 Ultra 96 Twin, first upgrade steps for more power and talk. I like it, man. More power. Um, Mike depends on, man, you know, with a 2010, that's kind of easy. The first steps on that, you know, we talked about twin cam versus M8 stuff, which stay up to speed on that series, guys. I uh, got some cool stuff coming there. Oh, and I've got my, my Chevelle. I'm almost done with the Chevelle. And I'm going to tell you guys a story of why that car means so much to me. Um, it's a bit of a, I'm calling it a, a short film, if you will, but it tells a little more about me. If you're interested in me anyway. My, me, my history, and what that car means and why it's so special. So that'll be coming soon. Um, the first place to start, Mike, is exhaust. Man, exhaust, high flow, and, and tune the thing. Yeah, you'll get a nice gain on a twin cam from that. Next step from there, nice set of cams. Uh, or you could do cams and just pistons and cylinders and do that at the same time. You'll get a nice gain there, and then you do head work on top of that. So definitely. Uh What's normal leak down rate? I have 5% and 10% on a new 114. Uh, the 5% is excellent, actually, Brian. The 10% is still really not bad. What concerns me is the 5 and 10% difference. Now, I will say, trying to do leak down on one of these things is tough. Uh, locking down the rear wheel, getting it in gear, making sure you're still at TDC, making sure the valves are still closed. I mean, it's, so it's possible that your variance there could be just because one of the valves is off the seat just a little bit. 20% um, is a major, major issue. Now, when I build an engine, we blueprint it uh, on a fresh engine. I want to see 4% to 4%, uh, and no more than 5 or 6%, really, even after a long period of time. Um, but maybe try to do that leak down one more time and then do a cylinder pressure test on it and count the number of revolutions each pulse when you get up to three or four or five, however many it takes, and that'll, that'll kind of help you out. Also, on that 10% cylinder, if you've got a stethoscope of any kind, listen real close at the intake, real close at the exhaust, maybe put it inside the exhaust, and see if you can identify maybe where that air is going. Also, listen in the you know, pull your dipstick out, you can kind of listen in there. So sometimes the noise will transfer to the crankcase. That'll tell you if it's the rings. Um, so it might be worth just you know, kind of checking into that. Um, nice t-shirt. Come on, guys, support the kids. Thank you, Flathead1930. I love a good Flathead. Flathead Ford. Not Flathead screwdrivers. I like Phillips better, but I do like a Flathead Ford. Um, not much else. Seems to burn rich when I snap the throttle. Dude, Rob says it needs computer tune for the pipes. What does he mean? Um, it, it's it's tuning, Richard. There's uh, 
different tuning devices. That's about reprogramming the ECM. And what I would like to do is invite you to look at all of our history uh, on our video history. You'll see one on fueling. That would probably be the best video for you. That's going to be in the description down below um, where it's all about tuning basics. It will explain everything to you about e uh, fuel injection tuning. Uh, come on, Kevin, just one more spam from Dude before we go. <laughs> Dewey, they're saying it with love, man. They're not picking on you, buddy. <laughs> oh, we love you. That's awesome. Um, uh, your email, Kevin at ProTwin.com. Michael, that is correct. And I will say one thing, guys. I, I get hundreds of emails a day. Uh, there's Facebook Messenger on my personal. There's Facebook Messenger on, on the ProTwin side, on the Baxter's Garage side. Uh, you know, and I've got like four or five different email addresses plus stuff coming out on YouTube messages. I try to get to everybody. I really do. Um, if, if you don't get a response from me, you know, give me a reasonable amount of time. Of course, if you don't get a response to me, uh, from me, that means I genuinely just didn't see it. I'm not ignoring you. I try to get to everyone and, uh, and help you guys as much as I can. And, you know, of course, if, if you're, if, if you want to buy parts from us and you've got questions about builds and stuff like that, then, um, uh, you know, always call the shop in and what Pete's going to do is, is tell you to email me. The reason why it's important, it's not because I don't want to talk to you on the phone. It's because what that email does is establish a history of our conversation. I talk to so many people, it's hard for me to remember a lot of the details. So if you take the time to email me, tell me about your bike, and you answer a few questions, it, it helps me to, to, so that when we do talk on the phone, I've already got answers to the questions. I know what questions to ask you. And if something happens and you call me a week from now, okay, I'm ready to go with that build, I've got our entire email chain there, and I remember what we talked about, and I can make sure I don't mess up. So um, if, you know, if you're reaching out to me, guys, I just ask you to be patient with me, you know. It's, uh, plus, I have to get bikes done and work on motorcycles too, um, which is the whole reason why I'm, why I'm here to begin with. All right, guys. Um, let's see. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do one more question guys, and then, uh, let's fire one more and then we're going to call it a weekend and we're going to go have, uh, uh, go trick or treat with the kids and all this other kind of stuff. Let me see if I can find one more good question and i can't uh, guys thank you enough uh, we've had 100 viewers bouncing in and out and stuff like that of course this is going to stay up but guys i cannot thank you enough for hanging in there with us um and for your support on the channel your comments your likes your shares uh we're building in an absolutely awesome community here and uh it's great i love it i enjoy it and looking forward to getting to know you guys we've we have visitors come in you know take tours of our little shop here and and meet and shake hands and all that. And of course, I appreciate the business. You guys picking up the phone, ordering parts from us, uh, and and bringing us your business too. Again, you're you're supporting a small business when you do that, and you're helping us feed our families. And uh, from from my heart, that means a great deal. So thank you. All right. So one more question. Um, I'm not going to count this one. How much to build a 57 iron head? We love iron heads, Richard. Email me, Kevin at ProTwin.com, uh, and we can talk about that. Uh, let's see. Got any holding parts? No, sir, but I know people in Australia that do. Oh, they don't make them anymore. 17 was the last year of that holding SS, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let's see. Y'all should live stream your builds. We're, we've got videos coming. The Skunk Works and the M8, or the Skunk Works M8 and Twin Cam builds, both of them are going to be videos. Uh, for our channel members, I will say I do behind the scenes stuff every now and then. So, uh, because with the, the channel member stuff, man, I, it's me working. I don't have time to edit. I typically don't have time to answer questions and things like that because I'm focusing on, on the stuff there. So I'll just kind of set up my GoPro and let it run for about an hour and people can, you know, watch me bore cylinders and stuff like that. If any, it, I'm, we've got several members in here that, uh, I'm sure have watched some of that stuff. If you guys like it, throw up, let them know. And, um, Throw it up and let them know it's, you know, if y'all enjoy seeing it and that stuff, that's a way to kind of see that stuff. Uh, Richard Alphas, Georgia boy, buy anything from you? Georgia, Georgia, no, I'll find just an old sweet song. It's Georgia on my mind. Love it. Anyway, um, 
let's see. When my bike gets done, might take a ride up. Love to see the shop. Bob, you're welcome anytime. Customer came by and I just missed everything again. Kevin, no, you didn't because you can watch it again. Kevin Roach, my friend at Cobalt Cycles. All right, guys, uh, that's it. It is 2.32. I have lost my voice. I am tired, and I've got a set of heads i got to do out there in the shop before I go home to trick or treat with the little ones. Um, guys, again, thank you so much. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Hope you have enjoyed this. If you did, you like the questions, you want to expand on anything, please do not hesitate to leave a comment below and let me know what you like. If you haven't subscribed, do that. And uh, the upcoming videos we're going to look out for. Sorry it's been a couple of weeks, but uh, anyway, we're going to do the Chevelle video. That one's special to me. I'm going to invite you guys, please take a look at that one. And uh, then we're going to continue the M8 versus Twin Cam video series. And I will say this. If you have any products you are interested in me reviewing, there's two things you can do. You can con contact those product manufacturers and tell them to give me a call. And uh, I'm sure I probably know who they are already. Or let me know uh, what products you would be interested in seeing reviews on. And maybe doing some install videos, tech videos, things like that. So, guys, awesome. Thank you. Who's left? Bob, Kevin, Carl, Ron, Chris, Flathead, Stephen, Dewey, Darren, Richard. Guys, thank you so very And there's 104 other people watching. I don't see you guys all. And uh, Michael Riggin upgraded to mechanic. Michael, thank you very much. Guys, thanks for the family. Thanks for the subs. Thanks for everything. You guys take care of yourselves and each other. Have a good one.